to the question, how is this going to end and when? I think the answer would have to be to accept some kind of intellectual humility mm. and say, you know, we are reaching the limits of prediction here. And what we can meaningfully do is, again, map out what the factors are likely to be that will affect eventually the outcome and keep monitoring those factors over time. The Chinese attitude, the Western willingness to support, the determination of the Ukrainian people themselves, what's going on internally in Russia. And within that, I think one useful added value for clients would be to also understand the information gaps that they may have or their sort of under theoretical gaps so for example or assum assumption gaps so in other words you know uh, if the media in general are under reporting on some aspects of of the picture then perhaps you you can contribute on those aspects and i think Uh, what I was saying before, you know, tr understanding how Russian society is shaped, even the sort of the industrial structure of the Russian economy, the extent to which uh, large uh, groups of the population are dependent on the state for their livelihoods, some of the psychology and the political culture that is that has very old roots. Understanding those factors will help also understand how resilient uh, the war effort could be in Russia, m uh, probably more resilient than a lot of commentators in the West tend to assume uh, because they work from the assumption of Russian society being similar to, West, to the Western society where they live. That's Carlo Gallo, and you are listening to the All Things Risk podcast. Welcome back, or welcome to the All Things Risk podcast. I'm Ben Catanio, your host, and this is my show where we go long form and use the lenses of risk and uncertainty to understand our world and ourselves a little bit better. In today's episode, we dive into the world of geopolitical risk analysis. And we do even more than that because in order to properly look at geopolitical risk, we also need to consider decision making in circumstances of extremely high levels of ambiguity. So this is a conversation that not only will give you many insights on Russia, it will also provide you with a number of useful lessons applicable to all types of decision making. My guest is Dr. Carlo Gallo. Carlo is the founder and director of Inquirisk, a geopolitical risk consultancy that provides analysis on geopolitics using a number of rigorous methods to help clients make better investment decisions. Carlo is an expert on Russia and the former Soviet Union. He has a doctorate in Russian politics from the London School of Economics. He has also taught geopolitical risk analysis to graduate students. And I thought that given the state of the world on geopolitics, Russia, Ukraine, and more broadly, that it would be a good time to speak to Carlo for the podcast. The result is a fabulous and fascinating conversation that covers both the methodology behind geopolitical risk analysis and how this relates to decision making, but also on Russia and its invasion of Ukraine, which includes a look at Russian society, why the Russian population for the most part is supportive of Vladimir Putin, as well as some considerations around how the Russia-Ukraine conflict may unfold and end. So let's dive in. Here is Carlo Gallo. Carlo, welcome to the All Things Risk podcast. This is fantastic. Great to catch up again and great to have you on the show. Thank you so much for having me. My pleasure. So we are, I think, going to have a very interesting conversation Before we dive into certain topics, I always like to ask people who they are and what they do, and especially the what you do part, because it's a terrible question, but I'm very interested to hear how people approach that that question. So who are you? What do you do, Carlo? Sure. So 
I am a political risk analyst and also a due diligence research professional. So basically, I help other businesses navigate a number of risks on the political risk front. Those risks would have to be relating to what governments around the world can do to uh, hinder or facilitate investments and business operations. And that includes uh, policy direction in a certain industry, bureaucracy, uh, corruption, but also then other social and cultural issues such as uh, organized criminal activities, in some cases also analyzing the terrorist threat to businesses, uh, even conflict, uh, of course. Um, And on the due diligence side, it is about helping clients understand who it is that they are dealing with in terms of the counterparties, personalities. Perhaps they are trying to form a joint venture with a foreign businessman. Perhaps they are trying to acquire business, acquire distributors, suppliers, supply chain sort of uh, elements. And then in that case, we would help them understand where are these people coming from? Are they legitimate? Do they have political connections that could be advantageous today, but problematic tomorrow after the next election? Mm -hmm. What's their reputation uh, for, again, probity and perhaps organized criminal activities in their past, business ethics and business uh, strategies and Mm -hmm. uh, attitudes as well? You know, are they very conflictive? kind of partners that are going to create problems down the line or they're very kind of accommodating in their uh, business posture. So, so yes, there's these two big uh, kind of strands to what I do, but it's always about helping other businesses navigate difficult uh, operational environments, mostly internationally, but, you know, Mm. especially on the due diligence front, I'm also working within the United States, helping private equity and banks understand who it is that they're seeking to give a loan or investment to. It's an interesting field and it's a super, when you talk about all these things, organized criminality and terrorism, and it seems very exciting, very sort of James Bond-esque. How did you get into doing this kind of work? Did you set out? Did you even know that this is a field and a profession that you can make a living doing Yeah, great question. So I started at the end of 2005 when I joined an international uh, consultancy called Control Risks. Actually, that's where we first met, me and you. (laughs) And I stayed there for six and a half years. But so at the time I was joining, I was just coming out of my PhD at the London School of Economics. And at that time, I didn't know anything about political risk analysis. Um, And to be honest, uh, geopolitical risk analysis, political risk analysis for business at that time was not as prominent in media commentary and journalistic kind of uh, exposés and and reporting than as as it is today. Uh, So I learned a lot on the job and uh, I liked it because compared to what I was doing before, which was very academic during my PhD, Uh, with an eye to becoming an academic at that time. Um, With this kind of profession, you get a chance to, first of all, interact with business leaders who are having to take very important decisions, often affecting not only millions of dollars of investment, but also the safety of their people when they dispatch their teams internationally. And so it is a way in which you can see that your knowledge is applied to very practical questions, very consequential issues. And that is uh, that is exciting. There is a lot to learn also from those conversations from clients. You know, over over the years, I've learned how business people think, which is ultimately extremely important for for any consultant. You know, trying to add value to your to your audience, to your clients. So yes, it's been actually a bit of a chance uh, start because uh, I didn't know anything about political risk, and uh, a fellow research student at the LSE had just been hired. I think a month before me, and he told me that they were looking for a Russia expert. Uh, my PhD was on Russia politics. So yeah, yeah, and um, I never. What led you back. to study uh, Russian politics? What was the? Oh the, right, the yes. So yeah. so that is a bit of a long story in the sense that I started being interested in Russia when I was probably twelve or thirteen year old, and Gorbachev was uh, a lot in the news because he was trying to reform this monolithic, very uh, lethargic system, which was approaching sort of a a very uh, decaying phase of of its uh, arc. 
And so um, at that time, you know, th through school, I, I, I had the luck that uh, one of our uh, teachers at school sort of encouraged us to read newspapers, to be uh, aware of current events, even at that young age. And I started being very interested in this uh, transformation. To, to be honest, uh, I mean, it fit with my broader interest already at that time for uh, sort of macro historical processes. I remember I was very interested in the big questions, you know, what what was the industrial revolution? What was the French revolution? What was the causes and consequences of these big transformations? And as I already started being very interested in thinking in terms of causes and consequences. I remember at that time looking at these big historical questions. And, and so the transformation of the Soviet Union kind of fit a little bit in this um, in this field. And I, and I already remember quite clearly that I had, a, I, I suppose, as I see at that age, I was kind of looking ahead at me and I was sort of um, seeing that I would be interested in understanding big political processes because I thought that a lot of millions of people would be affected by, say, the nature of a political regime, uh, democracy versus authoritarian, corrupt versus more rules-based systems. And so I thought, you know, if I if I become a doctor or something, I, I, I it's a great profession, but I would only be able to help one person at a time if I understand mm -hmm. these big <laughs> questions. Yeah. You know, millions of people are affected by them. So there was that kind of inclination. And, and then during my high school, I sort of kept studying the Russian language in my own time, kept reading and researching about this. Um, so this was largely on my own on my own time. And then at university, I also was very lucky because uh, a professor who had uh, emigrated from the Soviet Union in the 70s and had had taught in Canada and also in California, and his name is Viktor Zaslavsky, uh, just arrived to teach at the university I was doing my first degree in, which is Lewis University in Rome. And so I. Um, I sort of connected with him. I became his assistant. Uh, uh, I did my thesis with him and I collaborated with him even, even after my graduation during my master's and PhD uh, in London. Um, so he's been a big influence on the way I understand the Russian system, the Soviet system, and some of the legacies that are still uh, alive today, unfortunately. Was this in the 90s? So, yes, when I started, you know, as, as I started uh, in my when I was 12 or 13 years old, that was the 86, 87. The 86, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I finished my first degree in 1998 uh, in Rome. And so I did my thesis with this mentor, Viktor Zaslavsky, um, uh, finishing in 98 and then collaborating with him afterwards for several years. Um, my PhD, I finished it in uh, 2004. Um, then defending the thesis in uh, early 2005. Yeah, I can kind of see how you maybe wouldn't want to go directly into just kind of an academic path where maybe you're writing academic articles with an audience of other academics around the world when things are going on in the world that are affecting people's lives. And so I can see the attraction of moving more into this type of space that you eventually is have taken. Yes. I, I, I have to say I'm very fond of the academic approach. And, you know, in academia, when you're talking about the social sciences, there are many different schools and strands to every big question. And so it can be a little bit frustrating to try and glean a story, a narrative that is consistent and uh, monolithic. There is also a lot of plurality and pluralism. Right. And so for the big questions, uh, again, you don't have uh, a clear answer. There are many different answers. And depending on which approach you prefer, then you sort of fall into one school or the other and it's also methodological schools. But nevertheless, you know, uh, I I try in my work, I try to keep up to date with what's the latest academic thinking on relevant topics, because there's a there's a huge wealth of information and knowledge there. And to the extent that some of the questions have been explored to a great length, then you do have some consolidated lessons that you right. can derive from the academic research and writings. So okay. I always try to keep a dialogue between the practitioner side of what yeah. I do and, and the more theoretical yeah, understanding that's of the same problems. Yeah, that's an interesting space. I might have, might have been projecting some biases about academia there that perhaps 
we tend to maybe have in in some of these with some of these these questions. But maybe you know, let's explore that a little bit more because geopolitical risk analysis, as you say, is now is a bit more prominent. But when you started, was this sort of obs- obscure thing? But if you could maybe describe what goes into this type of analysis and how to look at some of these questions. How, how does one go about doing that in a way that is robust, but also provides value to people asking the questions? I mean, in business, I think people want the, you know, the answer. Tell me what's going to happen next month in Russia. But it's, it's much more nuanced. So it's a tricky space. It's a very interesting space between practice and a deep analysis. Maybe if you could just describe geopolitical risk analysis a little bit to my listeners. Sure. So uh, my work is uh, basically a field of consulting or research that is aimed at businesses as clients. So it's a commercial uh, endeavor. And that means that it all starts with a, a client who has a certain set of circumstances, priorities, goals, already a footprint perhaps of operations internationally. And so they they come to you and, and there is an initial dialogue where you understand, you're trying to understand what it is they're trying to achieve, where they are located, how their business works, and most critically, what makes their business tick. In other words, what, what is absolutely crucial for their operations to proceed smoothly in different geographies. And and that's a very important initial conversation and also an initial investment of research time on my part, because after you have understood with some detail is what the client is trying to do, then you can also understand what can disrupt uh, those plans or those operations that might be already in place, what may threaten this or that aspect of the operation, whether it's uh, perhaps uh, some uh, legislation that may intervene in the near future that may say, increase taxation from the, for that industry in that country, or whether it's increasing regulations that may benefit other competitors and not them. So you, you, you start understanding, for example, that you need to look at the, the shape of policymaking, the stakeholders within police policymaking sort of uh, venues in the country, institutions. Uh, or it could be um, to do with corruption issues, you know, how to deal with a, a bureaucracy that perhaps um, is uh, oftentimes uh, prone to uh, demand bribes under this or that pretext uh, at different levels. There, there could be, as, as we said before, also threats uh, of uh, an organized criminal nature to their operations. Kidnap for ransom uh, is related to that, for example, or or conflict. You know, the conflict could disrupt um, so their supply chain, even if not directly their immediate operations. Some of their key suppliers could suddenly be cut off from their geography simply because of a of a conflict. So I think. That's the, that's one key difference between the practitioner role and the academic role. The academic, yes, sometimes they are also tasked with consulting businesses uh, or mm-hmm. governments, you know, and, and some academics also double in uh, policy advisory roles. Mm-hmm. And But over, on the whole, they are trying to uh, describe the world in, in theoretical and general terms. Tr- they're trying to understand... The, the general patterns of, say, conflict, revolution, democratization, the big questions, um, terrorism. They're not looking at how all of that will affect a specific entity with, which has specific assets in specific geographies at a given time and processes that need to be uh, protected. So that's one key difference. So, but nevertheless, you know, as I said before, on some questions, it is useful to, for, for a practitioner, I think, to, uh, to have that kind of knowledge in your, in your toolkit of having studied those academic approaches on, again, it could be terrorism, it could be political stability, because then you have a deeper understanding of what can happen to your clients. And, and also uh, a small qualification to what I said, you know, uh, in, in some cases, some of the products that people like me produce are uh, addressing a, a broader audience. So, for example, if you are 
producing like a subscription service where uh, yeah. an, a range of different clients all read the same daily or weekly analysis, then of course you're not talking to one specific right. client, but you're talking to clients potentially in different industries. So in those cases, you are just commenting on the general quality of the business environment as a whole. But to be honest, that's uh, that's quite rare for um, for me personally in my in my uh, business activities to to have that kind of broad audience. It's mostly one client at a time. Right. So you have to, you know, for example, if you have a client that has an operation like a factory of something in somewhere in Eastern Europe, somewhere in the former Soviet, probably not so much now in, in Russia, but, but before maybe war breaks out and you might need to answer some very specific questions. What does this mean for us? What are the prospects of expropriation or of uh, violence against our employees or some other some other thing? So how do you go from understanding that sort of macro environment to something very specific for a, for a client? Yes. So a client can come and engage me on all sorts of different countries, geographies, industries. So I cannot possibly be an expert on anything, on everything myself. So the strength of, of my setup is the network of experts that are external to my company, but uh, people that I've known for many years and have come to trust for their expertise, reliability, discretion. And so on a project by project basis, I can pull in specific people who mm -hmm. are often based in the countries that we're talking about and have regional and in industry expertise, and they themselves have a network of local contacts. So oftentimes, 90% of the time, actually, I rely on, on that network to bring in the specialized knowledge and the sort of raw intelligence from the ground. And then I coordinate that. I make sure that the right questions are being asked. I sort of check the quality. I make sure that the deadlines are uh, observed and kept uh, and ask for the questions. So it's a, it's a kind of an mm -hmm. interactive process of communication with the on the ground sources that goes on for several weeks, um, typically. So, so yes, I, I mean, there is 90% uh, of the time, there is a, an element of bottom up feeding of intelligence mm -hmm. uh, from people who know, for example, what is the Ministry of Transport in Serbia thinking about uh, the next uh, type of trains that are going to be discussed in within government circles um, as to whether they are going to open up some kind of uh, tender for foreign investors to perhaps um, contribute to the to the train network to develop the train network or whatever other I'm just inventing an example sure. here um, so the the difference of course compared to what you said at the beginning sort of James Bond sort of yeah. private sector intelligence service uh, is that everything we do is legal. <laughs> yeah. And so we wouldn't want to uh, extract information that is privileged or confidential or that the sources who are talking about this are not supposed to tell anybody. So, for example, we wouldn't want to uh, interview the members of a closed parliamentary committee who is deciding on this or that initiative and, and, and it's, you know, market sensitive information that, um, you know, is not supposed to be divulged until after the, the, the public policy is fully announced. Mm. So, so we have to be careful about that. So what we bring to the table is not this kind of CIA uh, esque right. <laughs> uh, attempt to source uh, privileged information or I illegal information essentially, but it's about bringing to the table the expertise of people who have been following those issues for a long time and they know how those people in government tend to think and what their priorities are, who the key stakeholders are, um, wh what the relatively, relative power of different stakeholders in that government debate is so that we can come up with some prediction or some assessment of what's likely to come mm -hmm. up over the next few months in right. that, on that particular question. It's very analytical. Yeah. Just as, as you were speaking, I was just wondering whether or not you've had to turn clients away who th had the wrong impression, you know, that think that you're going to get some dirt on the ground that they don't have access to that can only be obtained illegally or whatever. Do you ever have to deal with that? Yes, it's happened rarely, but it, it, it has happened. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
Yes, and sometimes we, you know, we also have the kind of, you know, we could potentially reach into uh, those kind of um, rooms, so to speak. Mm-hmm. But um, uh, but we don't want to. And um, no matter what we could do, you know, there is a difference between what we mm-hmm. could do and what we want to do and what we are allowed to do. And sure. And and again, I think there is a lot of value to be gained from uh, an approach that is not reliant on on that. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit more about methodology and the nature of uncertainty. And uh, before we dive into maybe what's going on in your area of of expertise, particularly in in Russia and and, and Ukraine. But I think we have this sort of bias for certainty when we go out and we look at some of these ambiguous questions, particularly around geopolitics. And we're talking about human factors, right? We're talking about lots of variables. We're talking about lots of things that could go in lots of different directions. Many people get these, if we're making predictions, you get them wrong. And, uh, and yet probably I'm assuming you've got clients coming to you that they want an answer. They want something very uh, definitive to kind of hang their hats on. And uh, the world doesn't work like that. It's all sort of probabilistic and there are many features and things like that. I'm just wondering if you could describe how you you might go about taking some of that expertise and then providing an answer. Let's say, you know, it's a very specific question about what's the likelihood of 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 the government taking over my factory or you know, how do you, how do you take something that's nebulous? I mean, there's got to be a middle zone between it. It can't be just anything, but where, how do you go about putting some views together about what may happen and how to look at those things. Yeah. So let me start by saying that, yes, there is demand out there for certainty and there is a thirst for wanting to control what's going to happen. And now on some question, this is futile and actually misguided and actually, and even dangerous. So for example, if you want to, uh, uh, if you know there will be consultants, uh, think tanks, professionals who are happy to appear very confident mm. in predicting huge macro, political, geopolitical, international politics transformations over the next 10, 15, 20 years even. But I think the experience has demonstrated uh, very strongly that this is futile, and um, and that there is there, there are social events, international politics in particular, is so open to multiple interactions and also like um, it's a complex system in, in the in the specific sense of complex theory, whereby it is impossible to predict uh, how new variables will interact with variables that you already are aware of. Different factors will come in. There is also accidents that happen that then divert a certain trajectory in a completely different direction. Um, so when you're talking about 10 years into the future, macro political questions such as say US China conflict, will it become a hot conflict over Taiwan, for example, or something like that? Um, you know, and you're talking 10, 20 years, there's very little, I think that you, that anybody can say that is precise Mm -hmm. and uh, confident, although people would sound precise (laughs) and confident and there is no shortage of people trying to sell those information. So what I rather tend to do is, first of all, look at an horizon of maybe of four or five years in most cases. And, you know, the value added that we bring on some of the complex questions, say, for example, the development of the Ukraine-Russia war, how is that going to look in two, three, four years? How Russia is going to look in two, three, four years, for example? You know, uh, our job is not so much to e- express a definite prediction, uh, which is fully spelled out as to how things will look like. It's more about uh, alerting the client or educating the client as to what kind of factors are likely to have an impact on that question mm. so that uh, we are aware of um, what kind of things we should be monitoring over the course of the next year or two that are likely to impart a certain trajectory or direction to those uh, outcomes. So it's about framing the question, helping the client frame the questions, making sure that they're not missing some of those variables that are going to be important. Uh, and this also feeds into scenario analysis. You know, the, the beauty of scenario analysis is not so much 
uh, specific predictions. Mm. It's more about uh, framing, helping the client frame the question in terms of um, what could cause this scenario versus the other scenario, and also updating this analysis over time. So there's not just a snapshot. And and also very important with scenario analysis is that it forces you, at least if you do it well, it forces you to spell out very explicitly what your rolling assumptions are. In other mm-hmm. words, what are you assuming will remain constant across the two or three scenarios that you are presenting? And that's very important because those assumptions actually are often hidden in sort of narrative uh, explanations of uh, or predictions and and are ultimately responsible for how you frame the issues. So, for example, uh, you know, a lot of commentary on, on, on Russia over the last 10 years or so sort of failed to see the extent to which the Putin regime actually could use propaganda very effectively to maintain support and why, why that was. Mm. And we're seeing even today after this horrible invasion that uh, the bulk of the Russian population uh, expresses support for the actions of the armed forces in Ukraine. Uh, there are various things to say about that. So it, we shouldn't take that as face value. So, you know, and we can go into that in a minute. But so, you know, if, our, if you are assuming that, for example, the kind of thinking that some analysts inject into uh, assessing, for example, sanctions and whether Putin will invade or not invade. It tends, for many analysts, it tended to be a rational calculation, cost-benefit analysis for the country. So they say, well, Putin knows that if they invade, um, there will be massive sanctions. The Russian economy will 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 be hit. Um, you know, the Russia will be isolated. Right. Um, and so on and so forth. So a lot of analysts were saying on a rational basis, cost benefit analysis, the the benefits that he may gain out of an invasion of Ukraine are, are minuscule compared to this uh, backlash uh, in, in, on the economic diplomatic fronts. And so and so a lot of analysts concluded that Russia was not going to invade. Uh, but, you know, that, that is that is there is an assumption there that a leader like Putin decides these kind of things on the basis of cost benefit analysis very rational based on material variables and and also there is an assumption that that somebody like putin actually has the country interests uh, at, yes. at heart in in deciding while you know a different kind of framing of the russian regime would have provided uh, at least an opening for an, a different kind of mm. thinking, which is, you know, uh, most authoritarian leaders and uh, including Vladimir Putin and its close entourage are primarily interested in preserving their power, preserving their regime. And if that goal contradicts the goal of, of, a, of a prosperous country, they are, they are kind of very happy to find mm. a way to pers- pursue the first goal and, and forget about the, the, the other goal. And how they could get away with doing something like that, that's, that's then the next question. And again, it's, it's about understanding how the regime has been able to manipulate Russian society and, and why. Um, I don't know if you want to go into, into that now. Or... Well, uh, yeah, we could go into that in, in a few minutes. But I just, I, I, there's sure. a lot of really good stuff here about just about decision making in general when you're faced with a lot of ambiguity, a lot of uncertainty. And I think one of the things that I just taking away from what you're saying is the, the importance of actually just being very explicit about one's assumptions and just thinking about them. And I think that's a great technique in all types of really complex uh, decisions and then you can refresh and update those assumptions as you as you kind of go and also not to bet on one future uh, there are alternatives and and so i think that there's a really good conversation just generally about decision making under lots of uncertainty because effectively that's what sure. you're doing you're helping people make better decisions under uncertainty definitely yes Yes, absolutely. And in, for example, one could also borrow from some of the debates that have been ongoing within, say, the U.S. intelligence community. So there has been quite a lot of writing uh, over the years uh, about how to improve intelligence analysis mm-hmm. within 
the, the intelligence community. And some of that has been uh, declassified over the over the years, so it's available to, to read. And, you know, one of the dominant approaches has probably been that of um, uh, structured technique of analysis, uh, which is uh, ultimately about making your reasoning explicit. Mm. Uh, so that you know, even even in in a, in a physical sense of jotting down on a piece of paper, which uh, listing your key variables, your assumptions, what could go wrong with each of those assumptions, uh, almost like a brainstorming exercise that is actually written down on paper, almost mm-hmm. in a diagram. Uh, what that does is that forces you to externalize what could otherwise often times remain inside your mind, and it it offers also a tool for collaboration because then you can compare your approach to your colleagues and uh, there could be some kind of brainstorming some kind of um, a playing of devil's advocate in a way uh, and sort of uh, kick the tires of your argument mm-hmm. and and the and and the end result is an argument that is more robust and um, also if if over time you see that this argument is not quite playing out you have it there in front of you, spelled out in all its uh, various um, sub questions and sub factors and, and assumptions, and you can more easily pinpoint which of those elements of the picture has has gone wrong, and so sort of do something about that. That's again, it sort of reinforces the idea that being as explicit as possible about your assumptions and arguments, the various steps in your thinking, it's it's going to help. Obviously, when you end up then writing a report for the client. You probably most of the time don't have the space or the or the time for actually expressing mm. or, or presenting this diagram in its full sort of shape to the client. So, but if you have it as a tool in your in your arsenal, then uh, the uh, the output that you produce for the client will will show uh, that mm. there is uh, there is more uh, systematic reasoning behind what you are concluding for the client. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. I, I'm sure we could dive into that in in, in more detail, but um, but also we do want to get to questions of Mr. Putin and and the like. But th- it is fascinating because of how many, as you say, it's a we're talking about open systems, so many human variables, and just being explicit around reasoning is incredibly fruitful. And we often don't do that. And I, I suspect you, you probably run into this with clients is that you do have the, the clients or even the competitors that want to sell the solution that is the answer. And it's very seductive, right? Uh, whereas the more nuanced approaches to looking at uncertainty are much more effective. Yes. And also the other end of the spectrum in terms of what the audience out there thinks about these things is that, okay, well, the questions we should look into are so complex and so indeterminate, the uncertainty is so mm-hmm. huge that we we might as well not bother with the analysis. And right. you know, if we want to do the investment, let's do the investment. We'll worry about this later. In any case, nobody really knows what's going to happen. It's It's an impossible question. And that is also equally wrong, in my opinion, because uh, in my experience, almost always you can uh, actually elucidate a lot to the client simply by bringing some knowledge, in some cases, pretty basic knowledge from the ground in terms of how, for example, uh, the regulatory process, the the bureaucratic process of policymaking in a certain industry actually works in that country. They may have assumptions about that that oftentimes are intuitively carried over from their experience in their own country. Mm-hmm. So there's a problem of mirror mirror imaging. Uh, that is often the case in uh, dealing with foreign countries and different realities at all sorts of levels, including in diplomacy. But so there's often a lot to be learned from having conversations with that raw intelligence from the ground, uh, probing some of the basic assumptions that the client may not even be aware that they're actually having, that they're basing a lot of their thinking about incorrect assumptions. So basically, there's always, pretty much always uh, something to be gained from starting that kind of conversation, because even something for pretty basic and pretty easy to offer oftentimes can have big in, in implications for, say, the timing of a certain project, the, the expected you know lead time for something to actually happen, and and so on. Uh, and then, of course, you know, the 
there is a lot more that we can, we, you know, people like me can can do and, and go into a lot more details and have a sort of much more um, comprehensive approach that also helps the client understand that they have not asked all of the right questions. Mm. In fact, uh, one of the main things that we bring to clients uh, is precisely alerting them that they need to ask some additional questions when they are thinking to go into that country, in that industry at that time uh, that they're not thought about before. So it's not just uh, it's not even so much about the answer of the to the mm. questions. It's even just about are you asking all the right questions? Are you missing something? So it's about framing, you know, what are you bringing mm. into your field of view? What are you living out? Um, so, so in that sense, I'm not so worried about people who competitors who are busy, <laughs> you yeah. know, forecasting, trying to say exactly when uh, China will try to invade yeah. Taiwan and in what way, precisely with how many ships and yes. and stuff. Um, I mean, this is not really, I think, the the value that we bring. Although we can we can address those questions and, sure. and bring some intelligence intelligence onto those and some kind of a nuanced uh, scenario uh, mm -hmm. exercises. But Well, to interject a little bit on that, I, I think there is value in making predictions because then, you, as you say, you go back and being very clear about your reasoning. And I think there, there are things that one can do once you've got the reasoning very clear about even things like quantifying some of this stuff, because you, you can start to do some things that maybe are interesting if we're thinking kind of probabilistically and, and, and so forth, but just getting to the answer without actually looking at why one has reached the conclusion, that's that's where I think individuals and organizations get into problems because you can just hang your hat on, well, there you know, China will invade Taiwan in the year twenty twenty eight, do you know, doing this way and that way and, you know, whatever the case may be. I think oftentimes it's it's very similar to why horoscopes and fortune tellers have a business. You people like that sort of, maybe it's fun, but I think people also like that sort of certainty that this is, we're uncomfortable as humans with uncertainty. And there's, we, we, I think we get a little bit of something when someone says it's going to be like this and not like that. Yes, absolutely. I think you're right. You know, in general, psychologists have, uh, come to the conclusion that uncertainty is uncomfortable, uh, you know, as a, as a feeling. And so naturally human beings are attracted by the opposite, you know, um, and indeed, you know, what we do, you were talking about measurable uh, forecasts uh, and probability estimates. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes people ask me, okay, this is all good, but how can you measure political risk? Mm -hmm. And I think, what we're trying to do most of the time is to reduce the uncertainty. And again, in the ways that I mentioned before, and any reduction in uncertainty that is tangible uh, will be useful for the client, even though the uncertainty may not be eliminated completely. So, so that's how I see our job. And, you know, there, there has been, methods and, and, and approaches that are more quantitative oriented. So for example, you know, in the, the, this famous um, initiative that then led to the super forecasting book by Philip Tetlock as a co-author. Now, in that uh, approach, you have analysts who follow the uh, follow specific questions that are given to them uh, and are very uh, pointed questions, very narrow, narrowly defined questions, such as, for example, you know, will Biden visit China uh, over the next six months or um, something very concrete? And there is a yes or no mm -hmm. answer there. And so the analyst would sometimes, in you know, gather into groups and they will have some conversation that is, in fact, hidden, uh, at least in the tournament in the tournament version of this approach that was the starting of the super forecasting sort of uh, idea, the, the idea is that then each individual analyst would then put a quantitative probability to that question. Now, the way that the project, the Tetla projects understand that probability is the level of confidence as, uh, that the analyst has in saying yes or no to that question. And so, and again, and the way that that is measured is 
So if the analysts is saying 75% probability Biden will visit that country in the next six months, that means that the the project, the sort of the, 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 the calculation behind the scenes is that out of many, many predictions that the same analysts will have done, uh, whenever that analyst has attached a 75% chance of something happening, if he has he or she has been correct 75% of the time, then that analyst is well calibrated. Hmm. If actually those predictions turn out to be true only, say, 6% of the time, that analyst tends to have overconfidence. And you can have also underconfidence. And so I think this is called the Briar score. Mm. So so that's an interesting way of doing things. It started out of a tournament that was organized by the US intelligence community, the IARPA section of it. And in that context, you had thousands of analysts competing in teams. And out of those thousands of analysts, Tetlock was able to identify a few, I don't remember how many exactly who, who then, who were so well calibrated and consistent over time, and they sort of gained this title of super forecasters. One of the conclusions that Tetlock draws from that exercise is that the most successful analysts are those who update their probability scores over time mm-hmm. as new information comes in that makes Biden visit to that country more or less likely they adjust. Now, this setup as I described it, is very interesting. And also the, the whole premise of Tetlock's efforts are, are very uh, uh, worthy because he starts from the, an understanding precisely what we were talking about before, that there is a lot of uh, misplaced confidence in um, out there, especially in the media, where people who have a lot of confidence in predicting all sorts of complex outcomes, they actually get the most media attention because that's what the media and the public crave. But actually, Tetlock in his previous book in 2005, uh, poli- um, Expert Political Judgment, he had demonstrated that a lot of these long range, long range predictions collected over uh, multiple years and over many, many analysts and, and commentators mm-hmm. actually are not much better than just chance. Yeah. So, so anyway, there was that premise of, OK, this is this is not working. Let's find a way to be more systematic and quantitative and, and explicit and So that's all good. But when it comes to helping businesses uh, with their decision making and the work that I do, there are a couple of things that I think they're not quite, that they're different. Uh, First of all, you know, the client oftentimes needs to take a decision within a certain time frame. You know, should we invest or not? Should we send our people to that region or not by in three weeks time, for example? Should we sign that contract in three weeks time, four weeks time? So you have to do the best you, you, you can up to to uh, as to formulate your assessment up to that point and the consequences uh, that you are describing in your report in your analysis may actually take place one year two years down the line so i mean the smart client would then also engage you for some kind of updating of, of your s- assessment but most of the time you have to produce a, a, a one-off piece at the given time so you don't have that luxury of updating uh, that actually improves your uh, accuracy in your predictions according to the Briar score and the Tetlock super forecasting sort of setup. And the second difference is that, as I said before, actually one of the main uh, value add that we, we bring to clients is uh, not so much the answers, but the questions. You know, mm. are you asking the right questions? What are the right questions to ask about this project? For what reasons? And so what is the, the logic that could lead to certain outcomes versus other? What are the causal mechanisms? And so, and so the, the Tetlock approach seems to me that um, underplays that because the questions are given to the analyst and they're very uh, narrowly defined questions right. that... Don't, they're don't also in a, sp- they're in yeah. a vacuum as well, because for some people, it matters a lot whether Biden visits China. For others, it may be completely inconsequential. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, you know, from the academic work that Philip Tetrock has done, there has also been a, a commercial venture. I uh, don't remember the name now, but it's something to do with for, super forecasting. Um, and Tetrock is sort of involved, but it's, uh, it's mostly run by uh, somebody else. Um, and... So they would presumably have engagements from individual clients who would ask questions that are relevant to them, presumably. But how the setup of a super forecasting team that, how would that be uh, replicated in that scenario? Um, 
would they would the super forecasters somehow super forecasters somehow be involved in actually formul- formulating the questions that they get to answer? I'm not sure, but the right. the book the book that came out I think in 2015, super forecasting and and the academic scientific sort of work that sort of parallel to that from Ted Ted Lock, yeah doesn't doesn't necessarily mm-hmm. speak uh, immediately to to some of to most of yeah. what I need to do. Yeah, no, that that makes a lot of sense and. You know, at the very least, you're acknowledging the limitations of of that approach, but also acknowledging that it even you know exists. You have these like these analysts on Absolutely. political it's risk that, that somehow are producing lots of information. But I think it's always tricky, and even from the client end in my my day job, it's trying to unpick that. So as as a you know risk professional, trying to unpick that, but also internally trying to figure out there are a lot loads of biases in those decisions you know someone's bonus might get paid if they do get this investment approved or something something like this and so that on on both ends you're trying to you're trying to unpick all this this complex stuff and i do think there's benefit in at least trying to be quantitative because 40% is we know that 40% is 10 more than 30% over a time period versus, you know, something that's moderately likely versus unlikely, you know, all kinds of different interpretations of what we mean by that. So I really like this approach that you that you bring to the table because it's it is quite unique. It shouldn't be, but you know, it is it is unique in formulating the right sorts of questions. Again, I think that those that's valuable for any type of decision making under uncertainty is what are the, you know, what are the right questions? Getting to that point is a skill in and of itself. Yes, absolutely. It it means that you are offering an understanding of how the problem works, what, what makes that particular mechanism tick, you know, what are the key variables at play? Uh, Are you missing some of them? Um, Is, is mainstream commentary missing some of, some of that picture, as I was saying, hinting at some of, some of those in, in the Russian context. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that the, the Tetlock and, and every, everything that is around uh, business intelligence, uh, political risk analysis that comes from different uh, sectors, whether it's academia, the, what, what the sort of um, state security agencies in the US have been sort of debating. Mm-hmm. There's a lot to learn there. There's a lot to compare, uh, uh, whether it's almost also some, some of the risk analysis thinking that goes on in engineering. For example, it's also very mm-hmm. interesting, although, you know, it's not immediately and mechanically applicable to social phenomena. But, you know, there's some of some of the thinking there or um, psychology, of course, as we, we mentioned, some of the biases uh, that analysts and the audience has. And, uh, you know, there's this cognitive biases. And then, as you just hinted at, there is also conflict of interest kind of bias. You know, my bonus is going to come yeah. if, if the project goes ahead. And um, so. Yeah, there is a lot out there that is potentially relevant, and unfortunately, most of the most of, in my experience, uh, for, for 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 understandable reasons, you know, you don't get the time to hmm. be open to a lot of different influences. And um, but I, I try I try to to be aware of what's going on in uh, sort of related fields. Yeah, no, it's great. It's uh, very very valuable. Okay, let's dive into some of the things that are going on in the world in your your area of your of expertise in in Russia Ukraine particularly we've just passed the one year anniversary of Russia's invasion and perhaps maybe just contextually what types of questions are you seeing from your clients about this and and how are you looking at let's say the how this conflict may end and maybe we can right. go from go from there so since the start of the conflict, actually, Russia-focused work has completely stopped. So I've mm. not done pretty much anything, except at the very beginning, we've been helping some clients get out of Russia and understanding what uh, different uh, formats of exiting Russia would mean, how the local government would see mm. different attempts to exit, selling their assets and so on. But after that, you know, on, on the one hand, uh, nobody wants to go into Russia at the moment. There is also a lot of sanctions 
and, and there is also sanctions that restrict the ability of professional services being provided to anybody who wants to acquire interest in Russian entities. So, um, and that's UK sanctions in particular. Um, so I, and also for ethical reasons, you know, I, I'm not um, too uh, keen in um, helping businesses go into Russia, even if there were uh, something going on. So, um, and this is kind of exceptional because usually my personal ideas about politics are very separate from, mm. but in this case, I, I think there is an exception of, of ethics there. But anyway, so having said that, this is a huge development that we are seeing with the, the, the Russia invasion of Ukraine. For, for Russia, it means uh, steering the country into a very different trajectory, although it's a trajectory that's been built so sort of the basis for, for this transformation has been built over many years, but it's not a trajectory that uh, I think can be easily changed. And it's a trajectory towards, uh, first of all, more, more of a uh, even, even harsher authoritarian rule. Some people talk about totalitarian rule nowadays in Russia, and indeed some of the in instruments of totalitarian regimes are at play nowadays in Russia in terms of repression, in terms of um, jailing of uh, people who protest, also increasing control, state control over mm. all sorts of spheres of human activities, including education, uh, entertainment, morality. There is, a, there is an extending of encroachment of, of state influence into private life, which is also a feature of authoritarian, totalitarian systems. It's a direction that the country is going where it's isolated from the bulk of the global economy. Of course, they still have relations with India, China and other countries, particularly in terms of selling oil, which is the key variable for the Russian economy. Even there, however, the sanctions that uh, the West has introduced, the European Union has introduced and came into force in December, so a few months ago, uh, capping the price of oil that uh, Western entities are allowed to accept uh, to $60 per barrel. That's, uh, that's only starting to have an effect and it's going to take time, but it's uh, likely to, to have a much uh, different effect that we have seen so far where that kind of sanction had not been implemented yet. So, so it's it's a it's a direction where unfortunately the regime is leading the whole country as if the whole country was hostage to uh, to this uh, idea that Russia should be seeking territorial expansion, territorial gains under the pretext of security, you know, military security, and and in order to understand how the regime is able to get away with it, at least uh, so far. It's also important to understand that this kind of propaganda, this militarist uh, conquest kind of propaganda, nationalist idea that Russia has uh, a right to influence its neighbors and even, you know, uh, effectively uh, use force if those neighbors do not want to uh, remain into Russia orbit. Hmm. then that kind of thinking uh, is actually uh, relying on some propaganda stereotypes and slogans that are very old and date back to the Soviet times. And a lot of the older generation in Russia, they've been socialized, they've gone to school, they've seen the movies, they've, they've, they've grown into an environment, ideological environment that dates back to the Soviet times. You know, people in their 50s, uh, let's say late 40s, 50s and, and above, and they are kind of um, ready to as accept some of the, some of the uh, pillars of this narrative, such as, for example, that the West is out to get us, the United States is always trying to interfere and, and destabilize the Russian regime, uh, the Russian political system, that uh, the only way to be respected internationally is by showing force. And, and in, it's interesting also that if you look at what some of the more credible sociologists in Russia that have been studying public opinion since the late 80s, in particular, I'm talking about what's today called the Levada Center, Back in the 80s, um, Yuri Levada was the founder of this uh, outfit when Gorbachev sort of started to open up uh, for the first time sociological research. So they've been tracking this kind of uh, slogans and how the population has been uh, receiving them for many years, many decades. And they've come up with some interpretations as to why also this is, um, in what way this has been uh, accepted by the population and, and take it for granted almost uh, a critically. And, and in, in order to understand that also, we need to open a little bit of a parenthesis, uh, which uh, is probably best 
uh, referred to as the understanding of the four Russias. This is a, a, a phrase that comes from as another uh, economist, regional economist, um, Natalia Zubarievich, who uh, about, I guess, initially 10, 15 years ago, and then it came up with this idea that there are four different Russias inside the country in terms of the social, political, and economic makeup of different groups. And it has a lot to do with geography. And in other words, the first Russia is um, Moscow, St. Petersburg, and the larger cities above 1 million people. There you have the most post-industrial kind of economy, the information economy. You have the uh, skilled people who have uh, better levels of education. They perhaps they have, they have more contact with the West, more international exposure. And their outlook is... Uh, typically, uh, com comparatively speaking, with the rest of Russia, more, on average, more uh, liberal and more pro-Western. And then probably they make up 20, 25 percent of the population. Number, Russia number two is the, is the smaller cities between 50,000 up to 150,000 uh, kind of cities. And this is mostly industrial areas of Russia where uh, the bulk of the employment is in manufacturers, manufacturing of various types, which is machine building, steel, perhaps uh, coal mining in some cases, um, automotive. And this uh, is, is a certain uh, range, a certain group of the population that tends to have Soviet type of attitudes in terms that tend to be more paternalistic, they tend to expect support from the state that will subsidize some of these industries to maintain employment, even though some of these industries are not always as competitive um, as they would be in a purely market uh, environment. And then Russia number three is the smaller town, even smaller towns and villages and sort of the rural heartland of most Russian regions. Uh, and th these are um, people that live in an environment which is devoid of mobility opportunity, opportunity for social mobility, that where, well, the young people tend to go away as soon as possible, but sometimes they are trapped there because also they don't have the educational sort of uh, opportunities to, to really facilitate that kind of mobility. They, they tend to be sort of living out of an economy of uh, survival, you know, in a sense, mm. you know, expecting a lot from the state and especially the, the older generations in this, uh, in this group, they have the, the most sort of Soviet type attitudes uh, to things like uh, what it means to be a Russian, what is the United States up to, anti-Americanism and, and all that. Then there is also a fourth Russia, which is um, just the, the, the ethnic republic, uh, republics uh, in, the, in the North Caucasus that have a very specific setup. They are, they are Muslim republics where the, the birth rate is very large there compared to the rest of Russia. Mm. They are very different political culture. They're a little bit of a, a, little bit of a an exception that we, we can probably leave that aside for, for, for this discussion. But so basically in Russia number two and Russia number three, and, and in total you're talking about 60 65, 70 percent of the population, you have a social group that is largely dependent on the state, either because they are public employees, so school teachers, bureaucrats, uh, policemen, or they are employed in industries, companies that are directly or indirectly controlled by the state. And by the way, the role of the state in the economy, in the Russian economy, has grown quite significantly over the last 10, 15 years under Putin. So this means that it's very difficult for these people to even think of, say, going out in the streets and protest because you can lose your employment. Right. Um, you know, if you don't vote in a certain way at the, at the elections, you know, you may lose some of the uh, financing mm. into your little town, little villages that takes care of, say, the post office or mm. or something like that. Um, so so there is and, and also the especially in Russia, number three, the rural sort of uh, there is a social environment, this rural Russia that is very uh, social, what's the word in, in the West, we would say a social deprivation. There is um, there's a lot of criminality. There is a lot of drug abuse. There is right. a lot of uh, depression, very de depressed mm. sort of social and economic environment. Mm. And so in this kind of environments, um, those sociologists who have been studying this different groups in society and their attitudes for, for decades, they, they've come to interpret anti-Americanism and the support for the idea that uh, the Russian military 
um, has a right to impose its 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 force. I mean, Russia has a right to impose its will in its near abroad by means of military force, uh, as also a little bit of a of a sense of of, of a source of pride in a, in the in the context where your daily life actually is very depressed and right. very uh, uh, at the mer- also at the mercy mm. of the authorities. You know, corruption. Uh, there is uh, there is arbitrary law enforcement, um, so you don't have uh, really the means to uh, defend yourself mm. in in the court of law, for example, if something happens, especially if if against the state. Mm. So this there's a lot of groups in in Russian society, and in fact the majority, especially the older generations, that then take almost like a compensatory mechanism psychologically, uh, and take pride and take some confirmation of, of their self-worth mm. out of identifying with the state, with the Russian state that is making everybody fearful. Right. Uh, so it's it's getting respect internationally, mm. not because it's doing something particularly nice and good, but it's because mm. it's being feared. Right. So and that, again, that plays back to the, the Soviets, some of the Soviet uh, narratives in, in their own propaganda mm. back then. Um, and in terms yeah. of who's most pro Putin would be those groups, Russia number two, Russia yes. number three. Mm-hmm. So number two and number three. And, um, you know, when we say, when we see that opinion polls show that, say, 70%, 75% of the Russian population um, endorses Russia's military actions in Ukraine, uh, this is to be understood in a context where, first of all, th- especially in the rural areas and in the smaller town, uh, people don't really have easy access to uh, mm-hmm. Internet uh, sources of information because at the time, at, uh, at the current times, you, you would need to uh, have a VPN to bypass basically censorship of Internet media. And of course, the official media, state TV in particular, is the predominant means through which special rural communities get their information is completely dominated by the propaganda um, that is selling the story that Russia is there to defend ethnic Russians who are being threatened uh, by the, the Kiev regime. And also, you know, it's a it's a war against the West who's trying to take hold of Ukraine, enlarge NATO and then pose a threat to Russia's own heartland mm. in the future. So it's a prevented preemptive kind of attack. So, but it's in the context of when the media environment is very controlled and very monolithic. It's also in the context where people are, especially in the more depressed, economically and socially depressed areas, are struggling with their daily lives. And they are kind of happy to delegate the critical thinking about these things Mm. to the state and what they've been told. In other words, they, in a way, they, and this is again the conclusions that the sociologists of the, particularly the Levada Center have, have been reaching. In a, in a sense, in a certain way, uh, a lot of Russians are uh, willing to believe and happy to believe the narrative that's being proposed to them because it frees right. them from the responsibility of having to say, wait a minute, perhaps we are committing some crimes, perhaps we are mm-hmm. doing horrible uh, war crimes, uh, in, in, and, and should I feel some responsibility? No, this is not mm-hmm. my thing. This is something that you know the state. Now, the the change, uh, the exception to this way of thinking is is happening in September when uh, Putin um, announced the mobilization of uh, of new recruits. So, you know, up to three hundred thousand have been mobilized, um, mostly from the depressed areas, from the poorer areas of Russia. Uh, and so that has kind of broken up a little bit of this sort of psychology, because all of a sudden the war is not something that is shown on TV that is happening out there. And it's not really something I need to worry about because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm busy eking out a living. Yeah. But suddenly it's something that affects many families because people are being drafted. And there is also an expectation, wide shared expectation that there will be, there'll be more mobilization, even though Putin has promised not to. And so... So that is starting to change things a little bit, and we're probably going to see that that 70% is, is in fact, this is already a little bit declining. Mm. Um, but, um, but yeah, so th- it's important to understand uh, in what way Putin is able to sell a certain narrative, use propaganda very effectively in a way that we in the West would never conceive, mm. uh, based on some deep-rooted psychological, uh, c- political, cultural sort of attitudes that go all the way back to the Soviet times in many ways, and also I rely on the um, effectively the uh, lack of autonomy of vast groups of the population who are dependent on the state 
for their livelihoods, their jobs. Um, and in fact, you know, the fact, the, the, the idea that a lot of the brighter, better educated, younger, more dynamic uh, uh, groups in the population have left the country or are leaving the country, uh, in a way, it's uh, reducing the mm. numbers of the group that could potentially be independent from the state and, and potentially uh, have more liberal and anti-regime attitudes. Even though even for them, it is very difficult to protest these days because repression is extremely harsh. There's been thousands of people uh, arrested for, for joining protests. Some have been given uh, long terms of prison. And there is, uh, the, you know, the, in, in current Russia, there is really no organized opposition uh, to speak of that, that could channel resentment in, in an organized fashion, especially so, so beyond the sporadic uh, eruption of discontent in this or that town, this or that city. Right. Um, so, and that's been the case for for many years already. So, how, how bad yeah, would know. things have to get in, on, the, say, in the battlefield in in Ukraine for that to accelerate? Mm-hmm. It sounds like you're saying there's a you know the mobilization has affected some of the support, but it's not it, not enough to tip the yes, balance also, to topple Putin in any <clears throat> way. But how how badly would things have to go, and and therefore, what is Putin's calculus like here, given the current situation, which is at you know, the time of speaking to you, look, looks like we've got a very entrenched position in the battlefield yes. in, in Russia and Ukraine. So for the moment, Putin, the Putin regime has been able to spend a lot on, uh, first of all, compensation for families whose sons have, have died in, in the war. So there's been very generous compensation for either wounded or killed mm-hmm. members of family. Uh, so that has kind of pacified some of the issue that you could imagine would arise when many body bags start coming back into villages and towns. Um, unfortunately, the count of body bags is likely to continue to grow. And so that is one variable to watch, you know, how would the population at large start um, thinking about the war when this grows. Uh, the other question, which uh, it was already built into this first comment, is to what extent the Russian budget will be able to support the economy, which is under sanctions. Uh, so the so far, the government has been able to cushion the effect of sanctions pretty pretty well, considering, you know, the Russian economy, is, I think, has declined by 5% last year. Uh, there was an expectation that it would be at least 10%, 12%. Um, they have managed to do that by spending a lot of their budget, a lot of their reserves into a social, uh, you know, pensions, uh, salaries, increasing salaries, increasing pensions to, to match up some, some of the inflation. Uh, also subsidizing some of the industries so that they don't have to increase prices quite as much. At the same time, there's the budget that the portion of the state budget that goes into military spending has also increased dramatically uh, at a time when it was already growing very steadily over the previous years uh, leading up to the war. So the question becomes, how can Russia keep financing exploding military uh, budgets because they need to create many more tanks, many more ammunition, missiles and that are kind of starting to run a little bit short, some of those equipment. And also, you know, uh, recruiting more and more people, uh, drafting potentially more people into the army means uh, mobilizing more, more people also means training, spending money into, you know, uh, uh, providing the necessary training and equipment to them and, and also uh, depriving some of the industry of, of the workforce that goes into the military, so s- subsidizing those industries as a result. So it's a, it's a complex uh, calculation that I can imagine that if, especially these new Russian oil sanctions start biting, as people expect them to, to start doing this year, and if China doesn't step in and sort of provide much more economic assistance and military assistance compared to what they're doing now, uh, if those things don't happen, then I mean the 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 oil sanctions start to, to bite, and and China doesn't increase its assistance. Then uh, you know it's difficult to to quantify a duration, but you know time is not on Russia's side right. in that sense, because they they are running budget deficits, and the longer this 
continues, they, they may have to cut social, social spending in order to support the military effort. Uh, and that would probably increase discontent in the population. Uh, it's very difficult to imagine that that discontent would then fuel mass protests, you know, millions of people in the streets across Russia. That's not something we're seeing at the moment. But I, I would say things are probably going to get tougher for, for the Russian economy, for the budget, uh, for trying to uh, sustain social acquiescence to the war. Um, the, just just to sustain the military effort and you know to have the right the, the sufficient number of engineers allocated to the military efforts, sufficient productive capabilities to keep producing at the rate that Ukraine has been supplied. It's it's challenging. You know the the Russian economy after all is still small compared to say European Union economies, United States economies is very very small. It's the size of Spain more or less. So so the ability of um, of that economy to produce massive military equipment on top of all the other problems that the military is facing, you know, problems of leadership, uh, coordination, logistics, they, they've shown that they're not great at that and training. Were you and- surprised by their underperformance, the Russia, the Russian military's underperformance in Ukraine? Yes, I, I thought that like uh, all other analysts that I've heard about. Uh, at the start of the war, I thought that, as and, and in fact, I issued a little note, it's probably still on my LinkedIn um, profile, uh, where I would say, okay, Russia could militarily fulfill its objective of overcome, overwhelming the, uh, the Ukrainian army, p- perhaps conquer Kiev, perhaps conquer most of the Ukrainian territory in a matter of a, a few weeks. But I was going to, I did say, it's very difficult to imagine how they could keep the peace because I would not have exp- I would have expected that there would be an insurgency that they would they would not just um, as they were hoping you know be greeted with flowers right. in, in in their hands and mm-hmm. sort of accepted as liberators and all that so so I said in that little note at the start of the war that probably what will end up happening is that Russia will have to retreat to the Donbas the east of the country and to the sliver of land that connects the Donbas. Uh, to Crimea so that it creates a, a land bridge to Crimea um, and that would be sort of the the, the the sort of military map that would be solidified um, in the longer term. So at the moment indeed that's more or less what we're seeing. We're seeing that Russia is trying to defend that having failed to achieve the, uh, their largest objectives. So in that sense Putin has not achieved some of its uh, maximum objectives. You know obviously the whole of Ukraine is not capitulated. They have not extended their conquest all the way through Odessa and sort of connecting to Moldova mm-hmm. and Nistria along the, uh, the the shore of the Black Sea. But they could still present what they are having now as a as a victory internally in terms of having achieved that mm-hmm. kind of land bridge to Crimea, um, especially if they can consolidate the Donbas. Uh, I'm not a military expert. Um, a lot depends, I know obviously will depend on well-known factors, you know, to what extent the West will be able to continue support Ukraine for how long, you know, in terms of military expenditures and financial aid. And at the moment, it looks like there is a lot of determination to keep doing that which means the time is not on the Russian side in, mm-hmm. for, for what it looks now. Yeah, I mean, it's, to say anything more than that, it's, it's very difficult, I think, mm-hmm. not to put precise time horizons. Um, I mean, you could imagine, you know, the, the regime in Russia is very solid. There is no organized opposition. The entourage around mm-hmm. Putin is very much uh, invested in the regime. So it's not like um, they, want to, they want to change things because they are themselves part of of the regime as it is constituted. Uh, You could imagine some kind of military defeat, major military defeat, eventually creating such a political crisis whereby there is some kind of uh, way of replacing Putin with somebody else. And in the ideal scenario, in the best case scenario, you know, that next leader or or, or group of people would be, would understand that they need to sort of... um, scale back their ambitions, mm. military ambitions, and they need to come to terms with uh, Ukraine as a sovereign entity and and all that. You know, that, that's kind of the ideal scenario. Uh, at the moment, you know, there is no indication that that the elite is split in, in such right. a way. And But, you know, these sort of things have, uh, suddenly appear inevitable 
uh, after a long time that they seemed mm-hmm. impossible. <laughs> so there's no indication so. that the elite is split, even after Not really. everything I mean, we have that, seen, yeah. Well, mm-hmm. we have seen that there is split in terms of the military management of the campaign. So, the, mm-hmm. you know, various security organs, the military are kind of in competition with one another. The, the private mercenaries of the Wagner group are criticizing the military. The military <clears throat> command has been replaced at different levels pretty frequently over the duration of the campaign including at the very top. Uh, the, the secret services, the, the state security services are suspicious of the military. The military is suspicious of the secret services. Mm-hmm. Um, but there is no history in Russia and the Soviet Union of military coup, uh, uh, partly because, you know, Soviet leaders have, um, especially Stalin, with his paranoia, has been uh, culling mm-hmm. the heads of the military very consistently leading up to the Second World War and to the point where actually that probably harmed the preparedness mm. of the Soviet military when then uh, the, the Nazi invasion occurred. But um, so, so p- perhaps part of this uh, change of cadres, change of leadership in the military that Putin has also been doing is mm. in part an attempt to avoid that anybody could come up with strange ideas um, from the military side of things. Mm. There is also, you know, um, ultra nationalist voices that are given space on TV that they are criticizing the way that campaign has been run. So there is some split in that sense of some criticism has been allowed. Mm. Um, and, you know, one, one of the less, less uh, optimistic scenarios could be that the person who will replace Putin is even more of an ultra nationalist, even more of a militarist kind of person who criticizes Putin for not going far enough. Uh, and so wanting to do things like full mobilization of the Russian society, you know, mm. transforming society into a, a war society even more, perhaps uh, God knows, you know, uh, what they could imagine, perhaps even using tactical nuclear weapons, although it's very difficult to imagine what benefit, uh, even in purely in terms of the battlefield, what benefit that could achieve. Uh, so, yeah, it's uh, it's very difficult at the moment to imagine um, a Russia beyond Putin, um, precisely because society for, for now is still consolidated enough. But, you know, uh, again, time is not on Putin's on side, side, and yeah. ch- what China does is probably going to have a, a big role in how things evolve. Right. And I know you're uh, not a, a China expert, but I'm just wondering what you think the prospects of China stepping in and supporting Russia more overtly might be at this point? Yeah, at the moment, it looks like China is rather interested in uh, improving its image internationally by appearing to be a mediator in the conflict. Mm-hmm. You know, they've come up with 12 points uh, suggesting a possible uh, negotiation pattern for the conflict. It's it's not something that people are taking very seriously because some of these points are contradictory. And there's mm-hmm. also, uh, it's, it's almost certain that the two sides of the conflict would interpret even the first point in totally different ways. You know, this respecting the territorial sovereignty of Ukraine, or, or, or actually, sorry, as as the, as the first point is termed, uh, as phrased, respecting the territorial, the principle of territorial integrity in general. So Russia would then interpret that to include the Donbas as part of Russia, because mm. Russia is actually formally annexed those regions, and the Russian constitution now would have to be changed uh, yeah. to to relinquish those regions, uh, and obviously Ukraine would interpret territorial sovereignty as to include everything that was uh, part of Ukraine even before the annexation of Ukraine right. uh, of Crimea. Of Crimea. Right. So, I mean, it looks to me like China has not a lot to gain from the current situation, partly because the current war is contributing to a global economic slowdown, and China is still very much integrated in the global economy. The, 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 every point percentage point of global GDP that gets lost, perhaps due to the contribution of the war, means that, you know, that the, Russia, the Chinese economy has less opportunities for employment, for, for growth. Um, so, so, the, so there is that. If China want, was seriously contemplating an attack on Taiwan, I would imagine that having the, having the West concentrated, distracted uh, in, in helping Ukraine face Russia, it's a plus because it means less focus on the Taiwan issue and potentially, uh, I mean, I 
I've not looked into into details of, in terms of what kind of equipment is being promised to Taiwan, but it looks like some of the equipment, the military equipment that had been promised to Taiwan mm. has not been delivered. And there's this kind of a, a delay in that. And perhaps the fact that there's a lot of equipment going to Ukraine is partly part of that uh, explanation. So, so in that sense, you know, if China was seriously contemplating an attack on Taiwan, you could imagine that the West would find it more difficult to, to support both Ukraine and Taiwan at the same time. So in that sense, you know, there could be a, a positive uh, from the China point of view in helping Russia sustain that mm. conflict. It's hard to see even anything other than some kind of armistice, right? Because the Ukrainians wouldn't want to certainly wouldn't want to concede Crimea and the Donbass and Russia is, is is struggling militarily and it's hard to see anything other than an armistice that would then raise keep these, some of these questions alive for the foreseeable future yes uh, so there are so many variables there um, western support for ukraine yeah. you know will it will it be sustained and for how long and uh, in what to what degree uh, and first and foremost the determination of the ukrainian people to keep fighting uh, that's yes for them to decide you know so far obviously they've uh, shown ex- incredible determination and uh, commitment to regaining their sovereignty and their freedom uh, so presumably that's going to continue so what China does with Russia in terms of helping Russia, if everything continues as we're seeing now, it looks like uh, perhaps Ukraine can make some additional territorial gains, but it looks like we are starting to get into a, a kind of war that is a war of attrition where mm. territorial gains can come and go and and can be relatively marginal and relatively small. So eventually, if if nothing happens dramatically in, in those variables that I just mentioned, then yes, I, I, unfortunately, I think the likely scenario will be some kind of frozen conflict that gets uh, heated up occasionally with some actual fighting, um, skirmishes around the border, uh, a little bit like it was before the invasion of Ukraine, where Russia already controlled indirectly and also a little bit directly the eastern parts of Ukraine, the Donbass. But, you know, there's so many pieces of this puzzle that are right. up in the air that can still move. And so it's, sure. it's not something that's uh, particularly set in stone. Really fascinating. I'm conscious of time, but I, I think it might be useful to maybe tie this into the earlier conversation about, you know, asking the right questions, thinking about the, the assumptions, the variables that may change, given what we covered earlier and what you're covering now. And I think this could be instructive for any kind of decision-making. How how do you work with clients to tackle some of these questions that they might come to you about wanting to know, tell me what might happen with Russia, Ukraine, tell me what I should be doing, not thinking necessarily about doing business in Russia, but maybe in that part of the world or, Whatever, what, what, those kinds of uh, those kinds of questions. If you had a client that said we have, and we have some operations in in the Ukraine, what should how should we be thinking about this? Or if I've got supply chain dependencies, whatever it is. Yeah. So to the question, how is this going to end and when? I think the answer would have to be to accept some kind of intellectual humility mm. and say, you know, we are reaching the limits of prediction here and. What we can meaningfully do is, again, map out what the factors are likely to be that will affect eventually the outcome and keep monitoring those factors over time. The Chinese attitude, the Western willingness to support, the determination of the Ukrainian people themselves, what's going on internally in Russia. And within that, I think one useful added value for clients would be to also understand the information gaps that they may have or their sort of under- theoretical gaps. So, for example, or assum- assumption gaps. So, in other words, you know, uh, if the media in general are under-reporting on some aspects of, of the picture, then perhaps you you can contribute on those aspects. And I think 
uh, what I was saying before, you know, tr understanding how Russian society is shaped, even the sort of the industrial structure of the Russian economy, the extent to which uh, large uh, groups of the population are dependent on the state for their livelihoods, some of the psychology and the political culture that is that has very old roots. Understanding those factors will help also understand how resilient uh, the war effort could be in Russia, uh, probably more resilient than a lot of commentators in the West tend to assume, uh, because they work from the assumption of Russian society being similar to, West, to the Western society where they live in. Yeah, so um, that's really the best we can do. And, and of mm. course, in, if, if the question then becomes, okay, we have already operations in Ukraine right now, and we are having to uh, uh, get supplies from, I don't know, Turkey, ship through the Black Sea, and and there and there are, and there are you know <laughs> uh, navy vessels patrolling certain ports, or you know, then then it becomes a question of sources, sourcing the intelligence from the ground, understanding how exactly the situation is on the ground in a very tangible way, very specific pieces of information. So that's uh, less of a geopolitical sort of grand strategy forecasting, but uh, more tangible. And actually, I think that's where we can bring the most value, you know, in having the network to provide intelligence on practical questions. Um, you know, how, how, how much of a threat is, say, for example, Lviv the, in Western Ukraine facing from bombardments at this stage compared to other parts of Ukraine. Yes, what's going on internally in the, within the government of Ukraine? You know, is Zelensky still in control of every aspect of his government? You know, he's been he's been firing some of his ministers. There's, there's an effort to, to, be, to be seen as tackling corruption because that's one of the key variables for, for then Ukraine to be admitted into the European area. And, mm. you know, to, to what extent is the European Union likely to start negotiation for membership for Ukraine and at what point, or, or NATO also, mm. uh, will there be security guarantees for Ukraine if if some kind of settlement is reached with Russia right. on, on the ground? Are those security guarantees necessary to uh, make sure that business can resume uh, in the long term? You know, if, if you are investing millions of dollars in a facility, that's a long-term investment. You know, it's something mm. that you're planning to use for a decade or two decades mm. at least. So start to think around around some of some of those questions. Yes, and also, you know, what what kind of um, planning is already in place from Western institutions, multilateral institutions, uh, in collaboration with the European government to already start uh, rebuilding some of the infrastructure. Uh, what planning is in place for that? Which sectors are going to be prioritized? Um, is, is there going to be tenders? for foreign contractors to apply to? Um, are those tenders likely to be fair and transparent? Are you going to have to work with local suppliers? Uh, how do you select your local suppliers, your local contractors? Yeah, start preparing with a, with a detailed understanding of yeah. how things operate on the ground. Yeah, fantastic, Carl. I really like how you describe the key questions and the gaps, because I think that's instructive around all kinds of, again, all kinds of decision-making, because I'm sure there are loads of people who are listening to this that don't you know, work for a company or making decisions about what to do in the region. But I like how you frame your thinking around these questions. I mean, it's fascinating. The whole issue of the Russia Ukraine conflict is, is very interesting. It's very, you know, it's very topical, but I really like how you frame and just you can see your your thinking come out in how you describe yes these questions. I think it's, uh, it's just one one if yeah. I may add one uh, last thought you know one of the lessons that we can derive from what I said about Russia which is probably applicable more widely is that you know the media tend to focus on the personalities they tend to focus on the leader whether it's Putin or Xi Jinping or, and, you know, what they say and what they do and their mentality, their background. And in, in the case of Russia, it is an extremely personalized regime. There's no doubt about that. But to understand the basis uh, of support for, for political regimes, you really need to look not only at the political institutions, you know, what kind of set up is there? Is it a presidential system? Is it a completely authoritarian system? Is it a semi-authoritarian system? 
how are elections actually uh, organized, how fair they are, how competitive. But also, you know, you have to look at society and also the political sociology in a way of how is social, how are so, the main social groups organized, what avenues are there for independent social group to emerge and start building a real civil society that could counteract the state and um, be a force to be reckoned with. So you really need to go beyond what the media tend to portray and also what a lot of um, in-depth studies, they tend to focus on one issue, you know, the political setup, the, the institutions at the top. But you need to really understand also what's going on in the periphery, what's going on in the regions, what's going on with the, with the mentality, and then even look at things like political culture. You know, ultimately, there is such thing as collective memories, and authoritarian leaders are very skilled at pulling out of the drawer some of these collective memories, whether it's the Russian victory over Nazi Germany in World War II, sure. that's something that most Russians really hold very dear. So Putin has been re representing that in, in the context of Russia's actions in Ukraine, calling, you know, the, the Ukrainians calling them fascists is part of this. So, you know, in order to understand how resilient a certain course, a certain trajectory for a country is and so on. I think this is a wider lesson, you know, not just mm -hmm. trying to be mindful of state society relations mm -hmm. and, and have a good understanding of how society and, and, and livelihoods are organized uh, in the country. And it's, as opposed to just uh, analyzing and commenting on what the leaders are saying or doing. Uh, and that, that, it, that enables you to have an understanding of, of sort of slow burning tendencies of a country, which sometimes we get we get lost into analyzing the day to day or the week by week developments mm. and we, we see the trees but we lose track of the of the forest. Mm. And um, and it is very useful to keep both in your mind at the same time. You know, there is some underlying structural tendencies and, and conditions and circumstances of a country that would tend to favor certain outcomes in the long term. Mm. Uh, compared to other types of societies with with different histories and different uh, social makeup. So interesting. You mentioned memories, and memories can be manipulated. Our memories are totally fallible. And so a, a, a leader that can do that very skillfully can be quite powerful. Yes. Carlo, this was fascinating. I really enjoyed this conversation. For listeners who want to know more about you, if they want to get in touch, or they want to follow you and your, your company, if you could maybe talk a little bit about that, that would be a great place to, uh, to, to wrap up. Sure. The, the main website is www.enquirisk.com. And, you know, people can find me personally on LinkedIn and connect on LinkedIn and message me on LinkedIn. It's probably also very, very fast. Yeah. So, I mean, I, you know, as a, a little aside, I did also f start a separate company called Enquire Intel, and that was yeah. devoted to due diligence. And I acquired a private investigations license in order to be able to do yeah. due diligence work here in the United States. I'm based in California. Uh, I'm probably going to transfer. I'm trying to transfer that license, PI license, into Enquire Risk so that I don't have yeah. to run two companies at the same time and focus on Enquire Risk doing everything. We'll see if that gets accepted by the regulator in Sacramento. I, okay. I should hear pretty soon. <laughs> okay. So people will may 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 see that Enquiry Intel, the second company, uh, will 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 not continue uh, as I hope, and I will sort of consolidate everything into Enquiry Risk instead. But mm -hmm. that's that's a potential source of uh, confusion uh, over the next uh, few weeks. But other otherwise, you know, me personally on LinkedIn is always the best way to probably. Make sure that you, okay. you get uh, in touch. Fantastic. Carlo, this was great. I really appreciate you taking the time to speak to me and my audience. So thank you very much. Thank you. And for your questions, very, very useful and enjoyable conversation. This was a lot of fun. Thank you. All right. I hope you enjoyed that and found it useful. Give Carlo and Inquire Risk a follow. And I also say that because since recording this, Inquirisk received its California State Private Investigations license. So if you're interested in working with Carlo, you can find him at one place, which is Inquirisk. Links are in the show notes. As always, if you enjoyed the episode, please share it and or give us a positive rating or review wherever you get your podcasts. That's a zero cost way to help us out an awful lot. 
Thank you for listening. We will be back very soon. Until then, and as always, don't forget, risk is life.